Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our video where we show the results from our monthly Art Dare challenges. Today, we are talking about the January Art Dare. The focus of this prompt was imaginary landscapes. We're going to take a look at a bunch of the entries. And at the end of the video, we are going to announce who won the prize and the honorable mention. If you would like to grow as an artist, but you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you guys need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. This January Art Dare was actually inspired by one of our tutorials that we actually released just a few months ago. And that is this tutorial on imaginary backgrounds. Julie Ben Bassett and Kat Huang, who are in this tutorial, they demonstrate how to use all different types of image references to create an imaginary environment using ballpoint pen and watercolor. So take a look at that tutorial because I think it's really, really cool. All right, let's get started and take a look at some of the entries that we got. The first person we're going to look at is Hannah Kelly, who is from England. And I think the super cool thing about Hannah's entries is that she did two of them, which is so cool. And the thing is, what's so cool about these two entries is that they're so different. I mean, you look at this pastel drawing and you look at it against this collage and you would never guess that this is done by the same artist. And I have to tell you guys, I think at any stage, experimentation is so useful. If you are super experienced, you have lots of years experience, it's really great, but it's also especially important if you're somebody who's just getting started. And I think it takes a lot of guts to make artwork that's this different. People sometimes think that, oh no, I'm gonna lose my artistic identity if I try something different. But on the contrary, I think it really makes you a stronger artist. So I was thrilled to see Hannah doing such different work. Hello, 10,000 Crows. Hello to all of you guys who are joining us. Let us know in the chat what you think about these entries. How did these people interpret the theme of an imaginary landscape? Now, the super cool thing about Hannah's collage entry is that if you guys get up close, she actually got those paint swatches. Like, you know, when you go to the hardware store and you want to paint your house and you're looking at colors for 18 hours <laughs> and you're looking at all those little paint swatches. So that's basically what Hannah did is she took all of those paint swatches and she cut them up and created this beautiful landscape. And I also have to say, in addition to the innovative choice of material, one of the things that I love about this piece is that it does go beyond just your stereotypical here's a rectangle, here's a landscape. I mean, this image starts out somewhat predictably in that you have the sky, the sun, and the mountains, and you've got this landscape. But then I think Hannah really throws you for a loop in that all of a sudden, the ground almost deconstructs itself and it breaks down into this shattered glass-like motion. And I, I love that about this piece. I feel like if it didn't have that part of it, it would seem more like a run-of-the-mill landscape, but this, in my opinion, really makes this piece very special. So very, very cool choices in there. Let's see. Cutie is saying, I've always liked those paint swatches, very imaginative. I also really like the layering of the ground. Yeah, with collage, I think that layering is so important because depending on how you layer it or how heavily you layer it, it can really transform dramatically what the image looks like. Oh, and thank you so much for joining us, Seacoast, Tammy, and Joan. Okay, so I also want to say just a few things about Hannah's um, pastel piece, because what's really cool about this is that it's not just a pastel drawing. It's sanded paper with acrylic paint and texture and modeling gel. So there's all kinds of materials that are being blended into the surface. And it just makes me really sad that I don't get to see this drawing in person because I'm sure there's so many subtleties in the texture that I'm totally not getting an opportunity to see right now. But Hannah, kudos to you for trying so many different things because Hannah actually writes in her statement, which you can see on our main site, I'll send you guys that link later on, that these are all materials 
that Hannah has never used before. And that, again, that's also a risk for a lot of people. I think a lot of people are very quick to say, this is what I'm good at. I know what kind of results I'm going to get, and I'm just going to stick with that. So great job experimenting in here. Okay, up next, we have Joan Savitt from the U.S. And Joan, since you're watching, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your piece, because your piece, I think, not only is it really unusual in terms of the type of landscape you chose to portray, but that there actually is a lot of story behind this piece. So Joan wrote in her statement that this is going back to her Rust Belt roots and that this is an image which shows the split between people who are economically very comfortable versus people who are really hurting in terms of job loss in the manufacturing sector. So if you guys look at the image, you have these broken windows, which represents the job loss in the manufacturing sector. And then we have this more economically comfortable scene in the foreground with the nice furniture and everything. And it's a really strange image. I mean, it's not an image that you can figure out right away. And I do find that when I look at it, Joan, I really am curious. Like, I want to know, like, why are these two worlds together? And what is their relationship? There, there's something about that extreme contrast that you're showing that I think is really wonderful because it gets us thinking about what actually is going on in here. Oh, wow. We've got people from all over the place. We've got Darshi from Melbourne, Cricket, Sophie Legay from France. Oh, great. We're going to talk to your work in a little bit, Sophie. Denim Robot is saying it's so good. I like the green and the pink. And Darshi loves the concept. Cutie is saying it's like the wealthy are looking upon the disadvantaged. And Joan is saying, I really had to reach deep for this piece. I learned a lesson about how important it is to go into my heart. Joan, it really shows because I think that when you're talking about subjects that you have directly experienced yourself or you have some type of personal connection to, you can't fake that. People really can sense that connection. So even if there are certain parts of the piece that maybe are less straightforward, it's like nobody can deny you that authenticity in terms of your personal connection. And I would say, Joan, if this is the theme that you're interested in pursuing, this is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I could imagine, Joan, you could do a whole series of pieces based on this. I mean, there must be so much that you could dig into and explore. You can try all different types of materials. I just think you have a really wonderful subject matter here that could really carry you for a long way. And I, I think you're just getting started. And that's very exciting. I feel like this is almost the primordial soup for a series of pieces that you can do. And I also think it's interesting that the colors in the background, which seem to be the area that's hurting more, those are very lively and very bright. And yet, oddly enough, the color scheme in the furniture in the foreground, it's actually somewhat washed out. And so it, for me, at least, I almost feel like it's a commentary about how you could be economically very well off, but maybe emotionally something's missing or that maybe you're experiencing all these hardships and yet maybe you're powering through it. There's a lot going on in here. And oh my gosh, I feel like I could do a whole crit on this piece right now. We're not going to do that today, but some other time. Seacoast is saying the band of graffiti through the horizon really emphasizes the separation between haves and have nots. Love it. Yeah, it's, it's really bold imagery, Joan, and I really hope that you pursue that further. Okay, now the next entry we have is from Anna Maria. This piece is titled Day and Night, and it's a photograph. And I'll tell you guys, I am so happy that we're starting to get more submissions in photography, in digital media. In fact, we were so thrilled because we got our first short film submission. And we're going to critique it, I believe, sometime next week. Eloise, who is our resident filmmaker, was just swooning over this submission. So for all of you out there who have not been submitting your photography, your animation, your short films, send it to us because we will pretty much critique anything. I have not really seen a submission yet that I did not think we could critique because of its genre. So we're thrilled. I mean, in fact, I think a few weeks ago I got a submission 
for somebody who designed a table. And I thought that was great because that's an area of design that we haven't really gotten a chance to talk about. But what I love about Anna Maria's piece is that it seems ordinary at first, but then you start noticing that some things are a little bit off and it does it very subtly, which I like. I feel like sometimes when I look at photographs and people are trying to demonstrate that it's an imaginary scene, they almost overdo it. Like they try to make ridiculous, crazy colors that are totally unrealistic, or it almost becomes like a digital collage or something like that. And I just think there's so many smart choices here. And I think especially one of them is the color choices. Like, don't you guys just love that like hot, fiery lava orange in the lower right hand corner? Like that is so intense. But then do you guys see how that like really soft, misty blue in the upper part of the sky? That's such a beautiful balance against that. And then these like little pockets of these street lights have a slightly more saturated blue. And then the clouds on the far right hand corner, that's almost like a blend between the orange and the blue. So actually for me, I think one of my favorite parts of this photo is definitely in the color scheme. I think it's beautifully balanced. There's not a lot of colors in here. I mean, it really is just a riff on blue and orange being complementary colors, but it's really effective. So really nice work, Anna Maria. Cutie is saying, the more I look, the more I notice new things. Yeah, I'm doing the exact same thing. Like I was looking at it earlier because I was putting the slides together, but I'm starting to pick up on some more quiet little moments. And I think intriguing pieces do that. They keep you occupied. They keep you searching. So the second you think you have it figured out, something else emerges that you didn't notice before. And Joan is saying, even though it's a photo, it is very painterly. Yeah, see, I'm a sucker for that because <laughs> I'm a painter. And so, of course, I'm going to like it if it's very painterly. But Lauren and I did a critique. I believe it was two weeks ago or something. It was a person who had done altered photographs. And we looked at all these photographers who created photographs that really look like paintings. And I feel like this image to me it almost feels more like a painting than it does a photograph. And I find that very seductive. So very cool treatment of the material. And Darshi is saying, I agree with you, Tammy, such a beautiful piece. I love the blue and the orange together. Yeah, I mean, it does not have to have a complicated color scheme to be effective, guys. And one of my favorite painting units when I was an art school student was I had a painting teacher who made us do all these still lives and each still life was limited to a complementary color pair. So we had this one that was purple and yellow and it was all purple and yellow objects. It was a great exercise. And I think Anna Maria is doing that very successfully. Okay, the next artist we're gonna look at is Anna Shen from Canada. Now, Anna was saying in her statement that actually one of the pieces of inspiration that she used to create this piece actually came from Junji Ito. So I don't know if any of you guys know Junji Ito. I mean, if you know him, you will never forget him <laughs> because, wow, he's really intense. So the inspiration is actually from a story that's in this Junji Ito book. It's called Shiver. And I know this because we own every single Junji Ito book because my younger daughter is obsessed <laughs> with his comics. They're incredible. I mean, they're, they're not for the faint of heart. So if you guys don't like icky things. Don't read Junji Ito. But if you don't mind, he's a brilliant graphic novelist. So this is actually inspired by this Junji Ito story, which is called The Hanging Balloons. And it, it's such a weird story. I mean, I can't even explain it to you. Let, let's just say there are these people and their heads turn into balloons and it happens to a whole city and it gets really creepy. But so anyway, getting back to Anna's piece, I think you guys can see where that inspiration comes from because you have this grim reaper like character. You have these balloons and these faces that are hanging off into the sky. Really, really creepy. And I would also say that in Anna's statement, she explains that the theme of the piece is to create lingering souls in a graveyard. For sure. Yeah. I mean, really eerie images and wow, beautiful atmospheric perspective. 
my goodness, Anna, if you could be a poster child in my class for atmospheric perspective when I teach that unit, I want you there because this is great. Like, does everybody see how the Grim Reaper is really dark and high in contrast? And then as you get further back into the distance, the balloon people, they get smaller and smaller and they also get lower in contrast. And so those two things create a significant amount of depth. A lot of people are always asking me, oh, how do I make my paintings look less flat? How do I give them a little bit more of the illusion of space? That's how you do it with atmospheric perspective. And actually we have a video about that. So I'll put that in the description below later on so you guys can take a look at it because it's a really useful, very simple trick that you can employ into your paintings. That's really, really fun. Rachel is saying, I'm good at drawing, but my weekend is painting and I hate it so much. <laughs> oh no. Well, let me, let me give you some hope, Rachel. Okay. Because honestly, I don't think I'm a very good painter. Okay. I'm pretty good at it now. Like I'm competent, like to the point where it's not embarrassing and I can manage to teach a class and everything. But I was never a strong painter as a student. It did not come easily to me. Like I was surrounded by all these people who could just paint like it was nothing. <laughs> and it just was so infuriating to be surrounded like people like that all day. And it, it really takes time to figure out. And I think it takes a lot of trial and error because actually this is very um, serendipitous. I'm actually going tomorrow. We're going to do a shoot. We're going to shoot a tutorial, an oil painting tutorial with one of my oh, favorite artists ever, Kathy Speranza who I've known for many, many years. She's one of my colleagues, taught at the same art school that I teach at right now for many, many years. And she has been explaining to me how she paints. And I'm like, oh my God, why did nobody tell me this? Like if I'd known this stuff, I would have been a better painter. So Rachel, sometimes if you just don't have the right information, that can make things a lot harder than it has to be. But what I would recommend, go watch our oil painting tutorial because we got a lot of information in there. It's all the stuff that I wish somebody had told me like 20 years ago, but that's okay. Better late than never. Okay, so let's take a look next to Marina Marinopoulos. I'm sorry, I'm probably totally mangling your name. Marina is from France. And like Hannah, who we saw earlier, Marina actually ended up doing two entries. So she did this piece. It's a collage with watercolor. It's called Pink Landscape. And Marina also did this one, which is called Yellow Landscape. Oh, shoot. I mislabeled it in the slide. Sorry about that. Anyway, this is the yellow one. But what's really fun about these two collages is that they really belong together. I mean, they look very much related. They're like cousins, but they're also different enough that I don't feel like I've seen them both once I've only seen one. And I have to tell you guys, I think it's so cool that so many people for this art dare ended up doing collages. Like it's such a coincidence. Like we don't oftentimes get this many collage entries for a single art dare. I don't know if it was just, oh, everybody just ended up doing that coincidentally. I have no idea. But I just love the contrast marina in these pieces. I feel like contrast is really hard to do. I think a lot of times with color, people get so distracted by, oh, all the different colors, and they forget about the importance of having light and dark contrast. So this close-up that I'm showing of Marina's piece, yes, it's got beautiful bright colors, but do you guys see how the yellow in the middle is really light in value? and how all the brown tones on the bottom, they're really dark. And so when you look at the entire landscape, it's like the shapes really pop. And I think Marina did an amazing job of that. And the other cool thing too, is that if you guys look at Marina's pieces, I believe she did use magazines for this. I just feel like magazine collages, they just look so, for lack of a better word, magazine collage -y. Like it's so obvious that they're done from magazines. And I feel like with Marina's, I can't really tell. And so I think part of this is maybe Marina picked really good patterns and really good textures that are not so obvious what they are, but also the fact that the shapes I think are so beautifully cut. I mean, I love these birds, you guys. These are so gorgeous because you know what's cool about these? They don't really look like birds. There's only like two 
that I think you could identify as birds. And so those are sort of nice as the anchors. But I love how a couple of these shapes just don't look like birds at all, but they feel like birds. Like, isn't that incredible that you could have a shape that looks nothing like a bird and yet you looking at the image, you understand that it's a bird. Darshi is saying, excited to see that tutorial. Yeah, I actually just went through and I reorganized all of our playlists. So you guys should be able to find all of our content a little bit easier now. Sophie's saying that she loves the style and Joan is saying collage works in such surprisingly effective ways. I love these and Cutie loves the birds as well. Yeah, you know what guys, I was never somebody who did a lot of collage before and then Eloise Sherrod, who is a teaching artist here at Art Prof, she is like so into collage and she gave me such great tips. Like one of the best tips that she gave me for collage was she said that a lot of people tend to just use magazines and that's fine. You can definitely do that. But she said that when she goes to a museum, she picks up all the brochures because they're everywhere. <laughs> like when you go to a museum, there's a brochure in like every single gallery. And if you just pick a bunch of them up, they're really nicely produced brochures. They have art images on them. She also said it's great with magazines if instead of just finding images, you just cut out pieces of colors, pieces of patterns, because those are really good, I suppose, areas for the backgrounds. Like if you look at Marina's piece, well, I think Marina actually painted some of these as well. I think there's also some watercolor passages, but I think that a lot of people don't realize that you don't have to look for like a face. You don't have to look for a tree. You can just find like a page of blue and that can just go in there and be a really terrific landscape. So once Eloise explained that to me and I realized that, wow, there really is almost a strategy towards how to create collage, I was so excited about that. So give that a shot if you guys haven't before because it's really, really cool. Let's see, Seacoast is saying the lower grouping of birds looks oddly like a face. I'm gonna pull that up, see if I can find that. Oh, that is really cool. Wow. Well, a lot of people see faces in a lot of things. So anyway, oh, another thing you guys can do for collage, which is super cool. And Marina did this as well, is instead of just doing magazine collages, you can just get sheets of paper and you just paint them whatever colors and patterns, and that becomes your collage. So this is actually a project idea on artprof.org that Lauren Welch wrote. And she shows this very specific technique for how to do it. Guess what? It works because I did this technique with some of my high school students last year and they made these beautiful self-portraits. Like the colors were just, oh my God, it was amazing. So this is a really, really fun technique. And it's great because you don't have to look for magazines. Like you just make the colors and you make the patterns that you want and it's gorgeous. So check that out if you guys have a chance. Okay, next artist we're going to look at is Robert... Henke, sorry if I mispronounced your name, Robert is from Germany and you can see that it's a more lively, more um, painterly process, obviously because it's acrylic painting on canvas. But what I really like about Robert's piece is that there's so many areas of this painting where I feel like I'm starting to be able to recognize something, but then the second I think I can, it's like Robert just ganks it out of my hands. And so I almost feel like this painting, it's playing tricks on me. And yet it has a lot of motion. It's got a wonderful sense of space. And I do feel like it's moving. Like, don't you guys feel like the brushstrokes are climbing up the walls of this canvas or something? I don't know. There's a really beautiful sense of movement to it. And I do think there's a really nice balance of saturated colors because you have this like sort of palish yellow ochre tone in the background and that's sort of a nice base but then that allows I think these like cadmium lemons that are starting to leap out those are really beautiful and I actually like some of these passages where it's like these little tiny pattern speckled dots those add somewhat of a decorative element to these pieces which I think is really quite lovely I mean again this is another piece I really wish I could see it in person because I suspect that there's probably some gorgeous brushwork in there that I just am not getting to see. Honestly, I love being able to communicate with all of you guys on the internet, but the one thing that drives me just crazy is not getting to see the artwork in person because that's such 
a wonderful experience. And that's the one thing about a brick and mortar classroom that you just cannot get online. So it, it bums me out because I feel like I'm like missing half of the artwork by not being able to really take a look at that. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the details. And I think here you guys can see the layering of the colors. It's just very, very luscious. And I almost feel like I'm seeing, I don't know, little faces. Like I almost feel like there's these little like chimpanzees down there at the bottom. But I also think that there are other areas where it just loosens up and dissolves into this mass of shapes and movement, which I think is also very exciting. Let's see, Denim Robot is saying, I feel like I could see so many different things in this artwork. Yeah, I mean, part of me thinks, am I looking at a baboon? Like I totally see a baboon on the far left middle. I almost feel like there's an antelope in the center. But the thing is, I think Robert does a nice job of not giving us too much information. Because the thing is, you can give people so much information that they actually get annoyed when they can't figure out what it is. But I don't feel that way. When I look at this painting, I feel like I appreciate the moments and I get excited about them, but I'm not frustrated that I can't figure it out. And I think that's the balance to try to get. Oh, Nick Utri is saying a little like Marc Chagall. Yeah, Marc Chagall, I was just thinking this the other day. I feel like he's a little bit underappreciated. Like, I don't know that a lot of people really know that much about his work. Like, I was looking actually at the stained glass windows that he has at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I just was thinking people should know about him more. He's a wonderful painter. So anyway, if you don't know who Marc Chagall is, look him up later. I will put his name in the video description later on. Okay, next artist we're going to look at is Sophie Legay. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Sophie is from France. And she says in her statement that lately she has been obsessed with circles and that this piece is made with Posca pens. If you guys haven't seen these Posca pens, they're really cool. They're basically like paint markers. And so they're very opaque and they have beautiful, bright, saturated colors. And Sophie explains in the statement, which by the way, if you guys want to go to this page, it's the January Art Dare page on artprof.org. You can see all of the images. You can get all the Instagram links, website links. So the artists, you can read their statements. So this is a really nice chance for you guys to go back and reference some of the pieces if there's something you want to take a closer look at. And Sophie talks about how being new to the Posca pen, she had to do some trial and error. And that in the statement, she talks about how she's wondering if maybe the shadow of the clouds looks a little weird. So basically what we're talking about, you guys see how there's clouds in the sky, but then you can see the shadow of the clouds on the landscape. You, it's beautiful. I happen to disagree with you, Sophie, and I think they're great. In fact, I think they're one of my favorite parts of the piece. Here's why. Because... A lot of this landscape is somewhat familiar in terms of shapes. Like I think a lot of people have seen, okay, round hills and round clouds, that's nothing new. But the reflections of the clouds on the landscape, that is new. That is not something I typically see. And also what I love about those shadows is that's a beautiful area of overlap. That's an area where we really sense the lighting which is so unusual because your image is so graphic. It's like, it's all very simple, flat shapes. It's like, you don't have a lot of shading or rendering or anything like that. And so in my opinion, Sophie, if anything, I would do more of those clouds shadows. I think those would look beautiful. I think the one that's in the front, like the really big one at the bottom in the middle, that's like dark green. That's the one that I really like a lot because that one cloud has so many different colors in it. It's like a little blue, a little green, a little gray. That's a beautiful combination of colors. I would say the one in the back, which is like on the top of the mountains, maybe if that one had a little more color variation, I could get behind it more, but I would keep it. I really, really like those shadow clouds. Tell me you guys, if you like those, because I was struck by them and I think they're fantastic. Let's see. Another thing I would say to Sophie is you had said in your statement that you were thinking maybe that the mountain should be triangular or something like that. I'm going to disagree again. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I love the roundness of everything. And honestly, if you do those triangular mountains, I think it would become very, very generic. And actually, guys, my favorite part of this piece is the house. You know why? <laughs> because here's the thing. Like I said, 
we have seen round hills and mountains and round clouds and stuff like that. And usually you do anticipate, okay, there'll be like a little house or a building in there or something. But you always expect that that house or building is going to be rectangular or it's going to be angled, it's going to be flat. And this house just makes me laugh so hard because it's like bulging. It's like hysterical. Like I love that about this house. Like this house totally fits this landscape. So Sophie, don't change that stuff because the, the two things actually that you said you wanted to change, I think you could fix. You should stick with. I mean, there are other things that I think you could adjust. I'm not going to get into it right now because we'd have to do a full out crit for that. But hold on to those two things because I think they really make the piece very unusual. Let's see. Um, MC is saying, I like that I don't instantly know what I was looking at. And Nick Utri is saying, it looks like felt or quilt. I agree. The clouds really set the eye moving. Denim is saying, would a circular canvas work or overdo it? Oh my God, that would be awesome. Denim robot, that is such a good idea because it's like everything is round. Like there, there isn't a single thing in this entire image that's straight. I mean, the thing that should be straight, which is the house is not. And so that totally makes sense. So I don't know. I mean, Sophie, maybe what you could do is you could even take a picture of it and just crop it in Photoshop and see what it looks like. But I think that would be really charming. So I would love to see you do something like that. So Sophie is saying, okay, I should not second guess myself that much. Yeah, it's hard because you guys are all like this, right? You know, when you're just in your studio, you're by yourself and you're thinking all these things and you can't think straight. I mean, most of the time, it's just impossible to really figure out what you need to do. Plant King Boy is saying, I made an entry for this one back in January, but I didn't post it. Felt confused if it fit this theme. Is it more a landscape or city suburbscape? Non-English native problems. All right, well, what I would do next time, Plant King, is just contact us over social media. You can send me an email. You can contact us on Instagram and just ask us. We're happy to let you know if we think it works or not. Wow, thank you so much, Dreamy Lizard, for the super chat. We really appreciate that, you guys, because everything helps. We run Art Prof. It's on an absolute shoestring budget. And ask the TAs, because when they come to my house, they sleep on an air mattress. <laughs> like, no hotel, no bed. It's an air mattress on the hard wooden floor. So we appreciate everything you guys can do to help us out. Okay. Seacoast is saying Sophie's work reminds me of the Urte pieces. It's like color blocking meets deco. Oh, that is so cool. And Darshi is saying this could be your personal style, Sophie. You should do more. Yeah, Sophie, my feeling about it is that if you're going to do something, do it all the way. Like if you like circles, just go to town with the circles and see what you can do. And then if it's too much, you can always pull back. So it sounds like people are really into the circles. Try that. I'm really excited to see what you do. Okay, next artist we're going to look at is Claire Lynn from the U.S. And this piece is called Force of Spirits. It's a digital painting. And Claire talks about in her statement that she's trying to capture a mood. And the mood in this particular piece, she's talking about a fog. So she ends up creating this like ghost-like misty fog. And I love the transparency of this piece because I think oftentimes with digital art, I feel like people get really hung up on modeling forms and making things look three dimensional. And that's fine. I mean, that's very important for a lot of different types of images that you want to do. But I just feel like I can see through everything in this image and the amount of depth that Claire is getting in these areas. I mean, it's beautiful. And there, there's so many like little tiny, subtle, wispy little marks that you don't see at first. And then when you notice them, your brain just explodes. And I love the glow. Like we have this big, I guess it's like a fish-like creature or something. And I love how that creature leads the light throughout the landscape. And then you have these like smaller versions of it. Again, atmospheric perspective, okay? You've got smaller objects in the background. You have lower contrast in the background. Oh, I'm so proud of you guys. Now, I can't take credit for it because it's not like you're in my class and I like taught you atmospheric perspective, but when I see it, I love it. And I think you did an amazing job with that. 
Let's see. Tammy's saying these are all incredible. Definitely want to try to enter the ballpoint pen art fair. You should. The ballpoint pen one I'm so excited about because it's like the most just meager <laughs> art supply there is. And I will talk to you guys at the very end of the video, but that's the March art dare, which is ballpoint pen drawings and just anything in a ballpoint pen could be a little doodle that you do during a faculty meeting where, you know, your brain is just wandering <laughs> all over the place. I've never done that before, but anyway, um, check that out. And I guess what I really like about Claire's too, is I think the color scheme is really smart because it's a limited color scheme, but it feels very diverse because I feel like when we were looking at some of the other ones, like Anna Maria had the one that was just blue and orange. This one's interesting because it's like mostly blues, but there is variation in there. And Claire does, I think, sneak in a little bit of green. And that is actually really working well against the reds in the background because you get that, you know, complementary color, green and red, working off of each other. So some very, very smart decisions that I think are not super obvious, but then when you discover them, you get super excited about that. Okay, so the next artist we're going to talk about is Sandy Coleman from the US. And Sandy talks in her statement about how she's trying all these new things. Fantastic. I love that so much, you guys. And that what she used for this collage was actually photos from a food magazine. And there's also, I believe there's some Sharpie marker work going in there as well. And I, I love this passage at the bottom, Sandy. Does everybody see this like crumply lettuce? I guess it's a little bit of what, linguine <laughs> down there at the bottom? But it's like those colors really match some of the paint that's happening in the rest of the piece. Because you can see this is, again, this is collage with Sharpie and acrylic. And it's like, you look at this, you would not really think that there's such three totally different materials, but it's like, don't the colors in the paint really fit the collage? Like they really feel like they're from the exact same universe. And I think that's very hard to do with mixed media. I think with mixed media, people oftentimes underestimate how hard it is to make those areas cohesive so that things aren't too disparate. And I think the, the color choices that Sandy added into her pieces, that's what's holding this together. Because if it didn't have that, I could imagine it could feel very fractured and maybe the colors wouldn't work so well together, but this is very congruent, really nice job with the colors. Let's see, Justice is saying, never thought art could make me hungry. Oh, if you want that, there's a whole planet of Chardin paintings of like really juicy, luscious fruit. That always gets me excited every time I'm doing that. Joan is saying, I'm noticing the swirls in the sky like Van Gogh. Oh, wow, I didn't even look that closely. Let me see. Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, and did you guys see? I just noticed this. There's like Sharpie marker underneath the paint. Like you can see the Sharpie marker coming through the acrylic paint. Wow, that is really, really beautiful. Sheesh, you've got really good eyes, Joan. I'm really impressed by that. So wonderful, you guys, that you're all trying different things. And I hope that at Art Prof, we can help you guys do that because I'm sure you've heard me say before that a lot of people talk about, oh, you got to niche down and you got to get specific. And I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> I want to have a channel that has bookmaking and printmaking and film and animation. I want to have it all in one place because I just think it's fabulous. I love doing all these different things. Let's see, Sherry is saying the textures she created go really well with the magazine parts, right? Yeah, like if you look at the textures in the magazines, it's like if you look really close, you can sort of figure out what it is, but it blends beautifully with the paintbrush work. So I think really, really good work there. So if you guys want to go back, you want to look at some of these images, peruse the art statements, check out their Instagrams, go to artprof.org, just tap on art dares and you will find all that information there. All right, guys, time to announce who won the honorable mention and the prize. And really, you guys, we just do this because it's awesome to get a whole bunch of free art supplies showing up on your desk. But honestly, I think the best part of the art dares, it's really just being in a space with all these other people, everybody given the same thing, and then seeing how different everybody's pieces result in. Because I love that. Like every week I go to my drawing class that I teach on Fridays, 
I give the students assignment next week, everybody shows up and they have their own take on the project. And I think that's fantastic. Darshi saying, please keep the mix. I love discovering different techniques to mine. Oh, great. Yeah, because you know something, actually, you guys probably know that a lot of the teaching artists here, a lot of them were my former students. I also bring my former students who are now kicking my ass in the professional world <laughs> to do tutorials. And I learned so much from them and it's super fun. So I may not become a book artist, but I love knowing how to do Coptic stitch book binding from Eloise. That was just the coolest thing. Okay, not gonna keep you guys in any more suspense. The honorable mention goes to Anna Shen for collection day from Canada. So congratulations, Anna. We hope you enjoy your art supplies. And the prize goes to Claire Lynn who did Forest of Spirits. And Claire got a gigantic box of art supplies that showed up at her doorstep. We hope you guys really enjoy those. And I really hope you guys will all jump in and do the March Art Dare and that you will watch the video because Mia Rozier, who was also, again, a former student of mine, did this like epic ballpoint pen drawing. <laughs> and you guys can watch the video where I interview her and talk to her about her ballpoint pen process. And she gives all sorts of just great tips about working with ballpoint pen that honestly I would never have thought of. So watch that video. We just published it a few days ago and I would be thrilled to see you guys do this. And by the way, the March Art Dare page is also on artprof.org. You can find all the guidelines. We've got examples on there for you guys to take a look at. So definitely check that out. And if you do decide to do the Art Dare, which I hope you will, you can submit to us by posting on Instagram, just use hashtag artprofdare and tag us. And you can also, if you don't have Instagram, you can also post on our Facebook page. And if you don't have either, feel free to email me. I also take email submissions. And if you just don't know what to do, just let us know. We're happy to help you guys. I think it's really fun to help you guys move along in terms of the art dares and, and to watch everybody's progress. It's really fun for me to take a look at that. Yeah, the pieces were really great, Tammy. I mean... You, you guys, I have to say, like, I am just so amazed at what everybody creates every single month. It's just super, super fun for me. And by the way, guys, I hope you will go to artprof.org and check out more of our free resources, because although our YouTube channel has tons of fun stuff for you guys, artprof.org has even more. So check that out, because there's a lot of stuff there that you will not get on our YouTube channel. And by the way, I hope you guys will subscribe to our channel if you have not already, so you can get more resources to help you grow as an artist. And thank you again to our wonderful top Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. Thank you for all of you guys who did the art there, who showed up for the stream for your wonderful comments. We will see you next time.